Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello, how are you all? I'm sitting in the sunlight, but I'd forgotten it's actually bloody freezing. So I'm I'm very cold in my office. I have not switched the heating on properly. I hope you're slightly snuggled up and warmer wherever you are. Today's one is a true crime classic. So for those of you who don't like the gory and don't like the grisly, this one's going to be tricky for you. I'm, I, I don't even like to say this one's not for you. Obviously, that's always an option. But I want you here. I want you to feel included. I want you to uh, have a nice podcasty time. But I understand that this one's not for everyone. Many of you will have seen or at least heard of the slasher film Scream and all the other screams that there now are. I believe that, what are we up to? Like seven? But did you know it was written by Kevin Williamson, inspired by reports of a series of murders taking place in Florida? He was basically having a bit of writer's block and he followed the reports of these murders and sat down and wrote Scream. And even though the character in Scream doesn't represent a lot of similarities to the guy we're talking about today, just if you've ever watched that film and thought, this sounds, this just is so horrifying. It's based on a true story. You're welcome. So trigger warning. I'm going to try and, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but even going into not too much detail, there is murder, there is mutilation. So make it that what you will. I'll try and give you a little warning beforehand, but sometimes I just get so into it that I forget. So buckle up, everybody. Gainesville is home to the University of Florida, one of the largest universities in the United States. And the presence of the university shaped much of the city's culture and economy. We're going to be in the late 80s, early 90s today. What a time that was. A significant portion of the population, being students, faculty and staff, meant that during term time, I'm not sure now, I haven't focused on Gainesville now, I'm back in the 80s and 90s, it meant that during term time, the population of the town would almost double uh, when the students arrived. It also meant that this relatively small town had a rich cultural scene with music venues, theatres and art galleries. In the late 80s and early 90s, the city had a reputation for its eclectic mix of music, ranging from alt-rock to folk and blues. And it had a really busy, fun nightlife, especially in the area around the campus. There were halls we we call them halls in the UK rooms on campus but also there wasn't enough room for all students so there were these kind of apartment block areas that were for students to rent out Gainesville had a strong sense of community with residents actively involved in local events festivals and charitable activities the city's residents took pride in its cultural diversity and progressive values making it a welcoming and inclusive place to live When Gainesville, while Gainesville generally had a low crime rate compared to other cities of similar size, crime was still a concern, though it's mostly break-ins and petty theft, uh, which were rarely common, particularly in areas frequented by students. Quite often it makes easy pickings. When I was at university in Nottingham, we had locks on the windows in campus and that was to stop people breaking in. And still a number of times, I was always on the second floor, but a number of times my friends on the bottom floor would wake up and there would just be hands coming in the window to try and get stuff off the desk, which was nice. You know, break-ins and petty theft isn't uncommon, but what happened in 1990 was rare and deeply shocking for community. On the 24th of August 1990, a man attempted to break into the apartment of Sonia Larson and Christina Powell, two students at the University of Florida who had just started in time for the new year, the new semester to start. He found the door to the townhouse at 113 in the Williamsburg Village Apartments open and walked right in. It was a week before the semester was due to start and the two girls hadn't even finished unpacking. As he entered the house, he found 17-year-old Christina Powell sleeping downstairs. 
He stood over her briefly, but did not wake her. Instead, he crept upstairs and found 18-year-old Sonia Larson asleep in her bedroom. As she lay in bed, he started stabbing her, first in the upper chest area, stopping briefly to place a double strip of duct tape over her mouth to muffle her cries and then continued to stab her as she tried to defend herself. During the attack, she was stabbed in the arms and then received a slashing blow to her left thigh, which would lead to her bleeding out. After killing Sonia, the man goes back downstairs to where Christina remained asleep. He pressed a double strip of tape over her mouth, taped her hands behind her back, cut off her clothing and raped her. Afterwards, he forced her to lie face down on the floor and stabbed her five times in the back. Removing the tape and washing the body, he then mutilated and posed the bodies and takes a shower before he leaves. Approximately 42 hours after the first attack, about two miles away from the Williamsburg Village Apartments, during the evening of Saturday the 25th of August, the man broke into the apartment of college student, 18-year-old chemistry honours student, Krista Hoyt, by prying open the sliding glass door with a screwdriver. We don't have those kind of doors in the UK very often. We have um, kind of bifold doors quite often, but... You can get wooden doweling that you can put in the slider overnight that stops people being able to just break the lock and slide those doors open. If I had sliding doors, that's what I'd do. Armed with the same automatic pistol and K-bar knife, he waited in the living room for Krista to get home. Krista was an aspiring police officer. She'd been working part-time at the county sheriff's office, I believe in their like filing systems and she was going to the local college and she was a really great girl. And eventually she returned home at about 11 a.m. He grabbed her from behind, placing her in a chokehold and subduing her, then taped her mouth closed, taped her hands behind her back and took her to the bedroom where he cut off her clothing and raped her whilst threatening her with a knife. He then turned Krista face down on the bed and stabbed her through the back, rupturing her aorta and killing her. Just as he'd done with the first two victims, he mutilated and posed the body of his third victim and left the apartment. But he'd left something vital at the scene, his wallet. He has to return and not content with his handiwork, he decapitates Krista, placing her head on a bookshelf in the bedroom with her body propped sitting up on her bed. He sliced off her nipples and left them on the bed next to her. The police would also discover that her torso was sliced open from chest to pubic bone. After days of not being able to contact their daughters, the Larsons and the Powells became concerned. Obviously, this is pre-mobile phone, but any child listening, you shouldn't be listening, but any young person listening... That meant that if you said to your parents, I'm going to phone you at six o'clock, you phone them at six o'clock because you had to be next to the phone. They had to be next to the phone. You had to keep your word. You couldn't just nilly, willy nilly phone around. So these parents had been in contact with their kids. They had planned to speak to them and they hadn't. And so the pals who lived closest decided to go and see what was going on. So they arrive at the apartment and bang on the door and they get no response. So then they ask a maintenance worker to help get in. He says he has to speak to his manager and they have to call the police. That's the protocol. You can't just obviously open the door to an apartment. So the maintenance worker breaks down the door with the with with Betty Kernett the manager behind him and the police behind her and Betty would later recall quote when he went in I followed him in the apartment and I saw the young lady on the bed you could see she was in a bad position and I just turned around and walked out my maintenance man unfortunately ran down the stairs screaming oh my god and came out and threw up and the sad sad part about it is that we had the parents behind us on the stairs one local reporter remember it being the first time he'd not been allowed directly in to see a crime scene and he knew something was seriously wrong when he saw one of the seasoned officers run out of the house and throw up into a bush. 
The girls hadn't been seen since the Friday night when the residents had heard loud music. Weirdly, George Michael. And it, this was being played really loudly and they could hear someone taking a shower. As police were packing up from the first crime scene, they received another call. Krista Hoyt had failed to show up for work. So the officers who knew Krista, they worked with her, were to go to her apartment to check that everything was okay. When they arrived, her car was there and no one was answering the door. They looked through a tiny gap between the windowsill and the bottom of the blind and they see the naked, headless body of Krista sitting on the edge of the bed, still with her shoes and socks on. It was a horrible, shocking scene. Her stepmother said, quote, my husband would just sit and say, just tell me she died right away. Tell me she did not suffer. These police officers knew Krista. They told Gary she died right away from the first stab, which was the truth. But there were many hours before that. These murders gained widespread media attention and caused horror and distress amongst the community. It was early in the semester. As I said, lots of people were just arriving to start school, start university. And many students transferred to other universities. Many went home. The university, understandably, said that there would be no penalties for anyone missing classes. And those who decided to stay took extra precautions. They went around in groups. They changed their daily routines. And they even began sleeping in groups. So lots of them were either staying in each other's apartments in big groups or the kind of living areas on campus were turned into kind of makeshift bedrooms for those who lived off campus so they didn't have to walk home or, or go home alone. But this isn't enough to keep everyone safe. On the 27th of August at around 3am, the man enters a third apartment occupied by roommates and college students Tracy Pauls and Manuel Tabuada. Both are 23. They've been friends since high school and they were living together neither was worried so far this man had not attacked any men they were all women who looked kind of similar and Manny is six foot two 200 pounds he's athletic he's he's not going to let any harm come to his friend once again, the man pries open the double glass sliding door with the same screwdriver he used to enter Krista's apartment and armed with the same pistol and knife. He crept into one of the bedrooms where he found Manny asleep. He starts stabbing Manny in the stomach, which wakes him up. And he struggles to fight off his assailant, who just repeatedly rains blows on him, arms, hands, chest, leg and face. Hearing the commotion, Tracy goes to Manny's bedroom and catching a glimpse of the attacker, she runs back to her room where she attempts to barricade herself in. He breaks through her bedroom door, subdues her, tapes her mouth and her hands, cuts off her clothes and rapes her. As before, he then turned her over on the bed and kills her with three stabbing blows to the back. He cleans the body and, and poses the body, but... She's not mutilated. When friends couldn't get hold of Manny, one of them goes to the apartment to check that everything's okay. Unable to get an answer, they find a maintenance man who opens the door with a master key. He immediately opens the door, sees Tracy's naked and bloody body in the hallway and this dark bag on the floor next to her and realises all is not well. And very sensibly slams the door shut, locks it, and they go and call the police. The police arrive within five minutes and they get to the, to the apartment door. They find that it's unlocked. And when they open the door, they see that Tracy's body has now been placed on a towel and the black bag has gone. So either the killer was still in there having just murdered them or he'd returned to mutilate the body as he had done with Krista and had been caught in the act and this is why Tracy although I believe she was still posed lying on a towel she was not mutilated in any way but had the maintenance guy not had 
the foresight to just shut the door, lock the door, call the police. You know, it'd be so easy to think, do ch- check on Manny, see that Manny's okay, that kind of thing. But he just shut the door. Otherwise, who knows what could have happened. Except for Manny, who is the only male, all victims are petite white brunettes with brown eyes. All but Tracy are mutilated, all opposed. Police have two leads, including a 20-year-old former University of Florida freshman, but they're tenuous at best, and I'm not going to talk about them because... The people, as you can understand, this is not only completely unheard of in a town where there's really not very much violent crime, but it's over a weekend, basically, and it's shockingly brutal. So they they have two people on their radar whose lives are basically ruined because of this. The media you know, covers these people, shares pictures of these people. And so to go over it now is unhelpful. FBI teams are brought in, including John Douglas, to get a profile on who the killer is. Police Chief Wayland Clifton calls the killer shrewd and methodical. A local radio station turns on its contest phone lines so that anxious parents can call and speak to their children, and so their children can call home. And they reported receiving thousands of phone calls. In fact, the police lines and and these contest lines get jammed with families just trying to get into contact with each other. But news of these horrible murders spread. Louisiana police get in contact. They have an unsolved triple homicide from 1989 that they thought had many similarities to the attacks attributed to the man the media have dubbed the Gainesville Ripper. On the 4th of November 1989, 55-year-old Tom Grissom, his 24-year-old daughter Julie and their, her, 8-year-old nephew, so Tom's 8-year-old grandson, Sean, are attacked in their home as they're preparing for dinner. Afterwards, Julie Grissom's body is mutilated, cleaned and posed, and they also find tape residue on the victim's body, vinegar used to clean the body, which is the same as in the Gainesville cases. In both towns, the killer would enter the homes through back doors, and each home was near a wooded area where, obviously, he could observe the layout and everything, and he takes the tape away. The the reason they know about the tape is because there's tape residue left on the bodies, but he takes the tape away. He's obviously worried that it could lead to him being identified. When police tested the body fluids from the perpetrator in Shreveport, he's found to have type B blood. They test fluids found on the victims in Gainesville And they also are found to have type B blood. So they have a link, but no evidence and and no key as to who this offender could be. And really, it seems that from quite early on, they know that the two people they suspect are, are not really viable. The community holds prayer vigils and rallies and it it must have been this horrible feeling that someone amongst you is responsible. It's not just murder. It is absolutely shockingly staged, posed, violent attacks. And someone is feeling uneasy. In August 1990, Cindy Jurisic I I don't know how you say that name, I'm so sorry, heard a news report about a string of murders as she's travelling through the Florida panhandle. The report made her think about a man she had met at her Louisiana hometown church who had said some deeply disturbing things to both her and her then-husband, Steve. This man was named Danny Rowling. 
Cindy would say, quote, he'd come over every night for a while. And then one night Stephen came in and he goes, he's got to go. Stephen had told her that Rowling had told him he had a problem. Cindy said, what kind of problem? And Steve said he likes to stick knives into people. Cindy said she dismissed these comments when she heard about them because she didn't want to believe that Rowling could be responsible for the murders in Shreveport, which had happened six months previously. But also, I mean, you meet the man at church. I, many bad things have happened under the, the gaze of religion, but I can imagine you, you just wouldn't think that, you know, you meet, you become friends with a guy at church and he stabs people. Rowling had also to, told her, one day I'm going to leave this town. I'm going to go where the girls are beautiful. I can just lay in the sun and watch beautiful women all day. News of the Gainesville murders haunted Cindy, so she finally contacted police in November 1990 based on her hunch about Rowling's connection to the murders in both cities. She said, It would not let me rest. One day I picked up the phone, I called Crime Stoppers, and I said, I think there's one guy y'all need to investigate, Danny Rowling. Born on the 26th of May 1954, Daniel Danny Rowling was one of two sons born to James Harold Rowling and Claudia Beatrice. James was a Korean war veteran in the US Navy and a Shreveport police officer who often abused his wife and sons for frivolous things such as breathing in a way that displeased him. At one point, Claudia, who made repeated attempts to leave her husband, went to the hospital after claiming her husband tried to make her cut herself with a razor blade. According to Claudia's accounts, her eldest son, Danny, endured physical abuse at least once or twice a week at his father's hands, and the verbal depravity was daily, with James telling Danny that he was unwanted or an embarrassment. James once beat Rowling's dog so often that it died in his son's arms. As a teenager and young adult, Rowling was arrested several times for robberies in Georgia and Alabama and was caught spying on women getting dressed. As an adult, he had trouble trying to assimilate into society and holding down a steady job. He worked as a waiter at Pancho's restaurant in Louisiana. He worked at a Dairy Queen, but none of this lasted. He was married in 1974, though his wife filed for divorce after only two years. Interestingly, I've seen it in a lot of places that she resembled the victims in Gainesville in particular. And I've also heard that the victims resembled his mother. So whether his wife resembled his mother, I don't know. So after his divorce comes through, he turns to crime, serving eight years in prison for robbery. For robbery. His mother, Claudia, said she noticed a shift in him in 1988. Quote, his face got real hard, almost no emotion there at all. Just kind of deadpan expression. If I didn't know him so well, I probably wouldn't have known it was him. In May 1990, an argument between James and Danny Rowling resulted in Rowling shooting his father in the stomach and face. James Rowling survived. Danny did a runner. And later it was discovered that on the 5th of August 1990, Rowling broke into the home of Janet Frake in Sarasota, Florida. He bound and gagged her with duct tape and raped her. When he told her he was going to do this all night, she offered him a gold uh, she offered him a cold beer. Luckily, she'd come in from buying beer and he was in her house. And so he drags her into the bathroom and he rapes her and he says, I'm going to do this all night. And she says, well, why don't you take a break and have a cold beer? And he accepts. And she said, quote, it was weird. He went from one of the meanest, scariest, most violent sons of bitches you could ever imagine to being really calm and relaxed. He sits at the kitchen table and talks to her about her miserable childhood for hours. And she had read, you know, try and be humanizing all of this. And so she said she had had the most wonderful upbringing. She had great friends, but she said, you know, I, I agreed. I said, I'd shared the same experience as him and we connected over that. And after hours, she just said to him, I think it's time you should go. And he agreed. And he said, quote, would you do me a favor? Would you give me 10 minutes before you call the cops? 
She wouldn't see him again until she turned on the TV in 1994 to see her rapist pleading guilty to murder and serenading Sandra London in the courtroom. Although Rowling never admitted to raping Janet Frake in, 1990, in a 1997 autobiography called The Making of a Serial Killer, co-authored by the crime writer Sandra London, he described a sexual assault on an unnamed Sarasota resident shortly before he fled to Gainesville. Investigators respond to this tip from Cindy. She calls in, says, you need to look into this guy. And they track down Rolling. He's not hard to track down. He's arrested for robbing a supermarket in Ocala, Florida, on the 7th of September, 1990, 10 days after the bodies of Manny and Tracy are found. So they go to look for him. He's already in prison. That's a win. He's being held at the Marion County Jail, 40 miles south of Gainesville, and it's soon determined that he had type B blood, like the suspect in both the Gainesville and Shreveport murders. Seeing that Rowling had multiple convictions for armed robbery, they realised that armed robbery was his thing, and they wanted to look into were there any armed robberies near where any of these murders had taken place. And they discovered that a Winn-Dixie bank had occurred on the day that Krista Hoyt's body was found. Now, a policeman had chased the bank robber and followed him to a camp in a wooded area near the student apartments. And though the man had got away, they had found lots of stuff, including money stained with the red dye pack from the robbery and they had scooped everything up from this camp and they had put it in storage and they hadn't really thought much about it they were dealing with these awful murders so bank robbery wasn't top of their list and they just put everything away and they kept it in storage so that if they discovered who it was or if they needed to go back to it they could but they didn't pay much attention to it so they decide now is the time to go and look at all this stuff in this lockup to see if there's anything that could link this armed robber, Danny Rowling, to this bank robbery and therefore put him in the area of the murders. So they find in the evidence uh, a gun, a screwdriver, this bag of money and a cassette player with some tapes. The screwdriver is found to match marks on the doors at the crime scenes. There are 17 similarities in the marks found on the screens of the doors. And at the time, police had not listened to the audio tapes. Why would you? But once they have Rowling in custody and they are looking into him, they go through the tapes. And in these tapes, Rowling talks about going down the wrong path going down the wrong road, apologising to his family for what he's about to do, but saying it's necessary. So he alludes to these murders without actually confessing. So then they're pretty sure they've got their man. But there's nothing specifically linking him to these murders. Now, they do have DNA from the murder scenes, but for, I don't know how they were doing it in the 90s. They didn't have the the right whether rolling i don't know whether he told them he was type b b type blood but wouldn't give them a sample i don't know but while he's in prison poor danny rolling gets a toothache and they pull it and police put a warrant in to have this tooth tested for dna which is granted and the tooth dna was found to match the DNA found at the murder scenes in Gainesville. In November 1991, Rowling is charged with five counts of murder and brought to trial nearly four years after the murders. He claimed his motive was to become a superstar, similar to Ted Bundy, who had actually been executed, I believe, in 1989 or 1988 in Florida for the awful string of murders that he'd committed and so for most people they were still in Florida they were sort of a proud that they'd got Bundy and that he had been executed and and justice had been done but they were also it's very in the forefront 
if their minds, the trauma that that caused to communities in, in Florida and where, where the numerous places that Bundy attacked. So it makes him even more of a jackass to say he wants to be a superstar like Ted Bundy, you know, the man that everyone hates. In 1994, before his trial could get underway, Rowling unexpectedly pled guilty to all his charges. Uh, I've seen this for numerous reasons, including he didn't want to see photos at the trial of the crime scenes. He basically didn't want to look at what he'd done, uh, which, I mean, seems like a cop-out if you've done something so horrible. Subsequently, State Attorney Rod Smith presented the penalty phase of the prosecution this still, even if you plead guilty, it still has to go to jury so that they can decide between life in prison and the death penalty. And during his trial, Claudia Rowling, his mother, was interviewed and she detailed the abuse that her son had suffered at the hands of his father, who she still lives with. On the 20th of April 1994, the jury recommended five death sentences and Danny Rowling was sentenced to be executed. At some point, he's diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. He's seen by numerous psychologists and psychiatrists who all say that there is something going on, but A, that he's sane enough to stand trial, and B, some of it is made up. He sort of kept going on about having multiple personalities and that it was a different personality that was responsible for the murders. But Danny Rowling is one of those idiots who just really likes to talk about himself and really likes to be special. And, you know, I think it's quite hard to constantly fool a psychologist. We'll see. We don't know. But he is very much declared set fined to to stand trial he is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder borderline personality disorder and paraphilia he while he's in prison approaches true crime author sondra london who we heard about earlier and says that he needs her to help him write a book based on his life which includes his confession to the five murders and other murders that he hasn't been charged for. They write this book. They do get sued through the Son of Sam law, which states that criminals cannot make money from their crimes. But something else happens. The pair meet and fall in love, which is just horrendous. I just don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand all the women that were crazy for Ramirez it's such a I feel like if you're in love with a serial killer you should get fast tracked for therapy because not in a patronizing way but because I think it shows something's not quite right anyway maybe it's a form of natural selection They, they fall in love, they get engaged, he serenades her at his trial, the whole thing is horrendous. Shortly before he's executed in Florida for the series of killings in Gainesville, which takes a while because they stop the death penalty for a while and then they start it again, Rowling claimed responsibility for the Shreveport murders, handing his spiritual advisor, Reverend Mike Hudspeth, and the Florida police a written confession and apology. I'm going to read it now. It says, in order to fulfill all things that no stone be unturned, hereby I make a formal written statement concerning the murders of Julie, Tom and Sean Grissom in my hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana. Hal Carter, Julie Grissom's f former fiancé, is 100% innocent, totally pure of that crime. I and I alone am guilty. It was my hand that took those precious lights out of this old dark world. With all my heart and soul would I bring them back. Being a native son of Shreveport, I can only offer this confession of deep felt remorse over the loss of such fine outstanding souls. Have wept an ocean of tears by which mournful doth float upon a sea of regret. Danny Rowling. What a, what a dick. This dark old world is dark because of people like you otherwise it's fine i mean 
Oh, with all my heart, I wish I could bring them back. Don't take them in the first place. I mean, honestly. So this wasn't news to Scott Grissom, who's the, whose sister and father and nephew had been so brutally murdered. He said investigators were 100% sure that he was the one who did it. And honestly, they advised that he'd die much faster in Florida. And I said, well, leave him there. Leave him there. Rowling sang a gospel hymn when asked if he was going to make a statement before his execution. He, he didn't. He sang a gospel hymn instead, instead written by himself in, and in the minutes before his lethal injection at Florida State Prison on the 25th of October 2006 after the US Supreme Court rejected a last-ditch appeal. It was witnessed by many of his victims' relatives and Danny Rowling was pronounced dead at 6.13pm. And that is the story of the Gainesville Ripper who... I, I, the Grissoms aside, which was obviously a terrible murder just wreaked havoc for one weekend in Gainesville and I I think god Janet must have just felt like she was living a charmed life because he does the murders in Shreveport in 89 he then rapes Janet in May of 1990 No, and then in 5th of August, he breaks into Janet's home in Florida and rapes her, but she doesn't murder her. And then by the 25th of August, he's going on his rampage. Just a really horrible man. And he had a horrible childhood, but lots of people have a horrible childhood and don't go on this this horrible rampage. I just find it particularly, I I know serial killer is great, obviously, but to not want to look at the crime scene photos, to plead guilty to not look at crime scene photos, to write, uh, get a crime author to come, not a great crime author, I don't think, to come and write your autobiography because you feel it's worth being written to call Ted Bundy a superstar. You're just a bit of a jackass. There are some serial killers that are just completely fucking terrifying and insane. And there are some where you just want to punch them in the face for being idiots. And Rowling is definitely in the second category. It's just... I'm not pro the death penalty by any stretch. But I'm not sad that he's not around anymore. Back to Earth with the bump haven't done a full-on true crime one where obviously this is my visit to florida for for our trip around the u.s states there's florida's not lacking and although rolling is from louisiana and ted bundy is an obvious contender i feel like because gainesville is is in his stupid name it was worth worth a visit florida you've got a lot going on I can't think off the top of my head what comes after Florida. Georgia? I'll have to see. I'd love to hear your recommendations. So do email me, the Monday Night Review at gmail.com. Go and check out the merch. Get a lovely, ethical, super soft t shirt. I really genuinely love my t shirts. They're really comfortable. I'm quite fussy. And hoodies for you to be snuggled up in. And you can come over and find more on the Patreon. There are now only two tiers. I've stopped the top tier. So if you subscribe to the top tier, drop your subscription down a level. And I was going through there the other day and I was like, God, that was a good one. There are some good topics over there. So if you like what you hear, go and have a listen. You can join free for a week on the mid tier. So go and do that. It's pretty good. I mean. Obviously, I want you to join forever. But say you had a big road trip coming up and you want to join free for a week, you can do some good listening in that time. 